This time on Rat and Cat, I talk with Morgan Bailey about his day hike in the Columbia Gorge. It turned into a three-day ordeal that nearly cost him his life. <coughs> Welcome to Rat and Cat Search and Survival, I'm Nakia. This last January, Morgan Bailey thought he'd go for a hike just like he had so many other times, when a series of decisions led him down an unmaintained trail. Bailey recently shared his story with me over a video call. In the video, he's holding his phone at kind of an odd angle because at the time, one of his arms was still in a cast and he was suffering from other fractures and injuries. So I wanted him to be as comfortable as possible during our call. Thank you, Morgan, for agreeing to talk to me. I'm really curious about your story. It sounds like you had a crazy experience in the gorge, uh, so a mishap. Um, what? Wait, to tell me what 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 was your plans for the day? Plan for the day was to go to Eagle Creek uh, for the second time. I went there for the first time the week before, and I got a late start, so I didn't get in as far as I would have liked to. So, plan for the day was to get it. Well, kind of reset my personal clock, get out, you know, get out around sunrise and put in a nice full day so I could get to sleep at a reasonable hour and explore Eagle Creek a little further. But I got there at like nine fifteen a.m. and they were closed again due to the weather the week before. So I went to the next closest trailhead, which was Gordon's Creek, which was open, but in my opinion, probably should have been closed. But. What's your experience level like in the outdoors? Not much. Uh, scouts, um, you know, day hikes here and there. You know, I can't remember the last time I went camping outside of a music festival, you know. And, um, I usually seek more challenging hikes, but no, usually nothing like overnight um, or any deep backcountry, you know, backpacky type stuff, you know, so. Um, I've been on some kind of sketchy trails, but not like the one that I got lost on. So, so you saw this trail. What where was your goal to get on it? Where where were you gonna go? Um, I just wanted to put it in like a full day. Like I said, I, I wanted to go. You know, I had it timed to where I think it around. I got started around nine thirty, so I wanted to be back to my car by like you know five thirty, like shortly after. I wanted to be close close to the trailhead by dusk. You know, so I was either going to go up to a certain point to about 1 32 o'clock and turn back. At that point, I realized it was a loop that I was on. So I was like, okay, I'm about halfway done with the loop. I might as well finish it. So that was the goal for the day was to put in a nice full seven, eight hours. Um, and, you know, get, get a good amount of exercise in and get a, a good night's rest that night. So what was that first part of the hike like? Um, the first like two hours were pretty flat and boring. Um, and then it started getting a little challenging and you know, it started turning up towards like uh, Indian point. Um, and about that, I'd say half hour to 45 minutes before that halfway point is when I started losing the trail and having to use my phone's GPS to keep me on trail. Like it was very poorly made. It hadn't been maintained in quite some time, you know, like up until it started getting, you know, steep. You know, even when I could stay on trail, there was a lot of debris and fallen trees and a couple little sketchy spots, but, you know, nothing that I couldn't handle. You know, I could still see the trail. And then, um, yeah, shortly before that halfway point is when I, I kept losing the trail because there was just no indicators of trail, you know. Um, you know, I couldn't see any tape or, you know, saw cut branches or anything, you know, and, and it was just not very well kept since the since the fires of the last washouts. So. Oh, wow. Yeah, wow. probably shouldn't have been open. Like I said, like like right when I got to the trailhead, like to the left of me, you could have gone left or right, and the left side was all chain linked off and like no access, but the right side was open, and so I just went with it. You got off trail. You then what happened? So all right, so I'll, I'll backtrack a little bit to that. So I get that at that at that halfway point where I could either turn back or continue the loop, the trail had improved. You know, like I could see it again. I was like, okay, I think the worst of it's behind me might as well finish the loop, you know, um, and it looks like it's starting to head back down at this point, you know, so I, I decided to finish the loop. Um, and then I got up and there was parts that were official trail after that point that were like the, I don't know if you saw the Facebook post about it, but there's like a picture of Mount Adams with my online detailing of it. Um, and then where I took that picture from was just like a narrow, you know, like slope like that, you know, where you had to kind of lean on the side of the cliff, you know, it was just like crumbling narrow slope that was part of the trail where like, if you slipped, all you had to grab was like prickly thorn branches, you know, like literally. And um, so at that point, 
uh, shortly before dark, like an hour before dark, and the trail got worse. And then I was up above the snow line at that point. Um, and the trail continued to get worse. And I was, you know, my phone was still helping me stay on it. And I was still, I'm pretty good at spotting you know, signs of trail. There were some footprints at one point. And, you know, there was like signs of cut trees and stuff, you know, like man, man cut trees and, and whatnot. And um, I'm like, okay, well, this sucks. And I kept using my phone. I wasn't, I didn't have my phone out the whole time because I didn't want to kill it. And there was a point where it looked like I just needed to, you know, I found the trail again. And, or, you know, my phone said I was on the trail. I didn't see any indicator of trail at all. I didn't even see footprints at this point. And it was just like, okay, it looks like I just had to walk forward in a straight line for about 30 to 50 yards. I'm like, okay, I can do that. Put the phone away, did that. And then I realized there was no way in hell I was on a trail, pulled the phone out again and it was dead. So at that point, and at that point I couldn't have even backtracked back to trail if I wanted to, like I was just lost. It was starting to get dark. Um, and I wouldn't have, there was parts that I wouldn't have wanted to traverse after dark anyway, even if I could have gotten back on the trail that I was on. So I figured at that point, my options were to shelter in place where I was above the snow line for the night and run the risk of hypothermia or an unpleasant wildlife encounter, or I could just kind of keep moving gently, mindfully kind of down and follow water towards the general direction of the trailhead, which is what I chose to do. And at first it was, you know, kind of a, you know, I kind of had to slide it, but it wasn't just vertical, nasty cliffs, you know, and, but then it, it eventually turned into just steep drop-offs and waterfalls and cliffs on the side of me and that, yeah. What looked like the easiest route back to the river was really a trap. Bailey had headed into a hidden box canyon, camouflaged by dense foliage, a trap with almost no way out, so inaccessible that few, if any, have ventured there. It's difficult to understand just how treacherous this area is without being on the ground. From a regular map or even from a satellite view, one might assume the area is nothing more than a steep slope with a creek at the bottom. But an aerial LiDAR image can help us get a little better perspective. Aerial LiDAR is an imaging technique that scans the ground with lasers, creating millions of position data points. Some of those laser pinpoints fall below the tree line onto the actual ground. That data can then be filtered to remove the upper layer of the forest canopy, revealing the ground below. If we convert that data into slope degrees, things become even more clear. On this map, the steep canyon walls are shaded in light blue, while the lower elevations of the deep canyon floor are shaded dark blue. The points where these shaded elements narrow and converge reveal the steep waterfalls and cliffs that trapped Bailey. Yeah, they, uh spent the whole first night just kind of, I don't know if you saw the Facebook post about it, but uh, okay. I called it like kind of like a high stakes game of Twister. You know, I was kind of like on my back, kind of like crab walking over these just giant piles of washed out trees and debris and stuff. Just really, I didn't even have a headlamp. You know, I just had a little pocket flashlight like in my mouth, you know, and just really carefully testing each foot and handhold. And, you know, I could only see 10, 20 yards maybe at a time ahead of me, you know? And so I'll just kind of plot to get as far down as I could see. And then there would be points where I'm like, okay, I can't go any further down this way. I'm gonna have to like backtrack back, kind of scale up and around, you know? And that was like the whole first, I just stayed up the entire first night doing that. And then I didn't want to fall asleep in the cold or, you know, get eaten by anything, you know? So I waited till shortly after sunrise to curl up and sleep for a minute. Or how were you feeling at this uh, point? at that point in in the on the in when i was out there mm -hmm. um frustrated but not i mean there was times where i could see the columbia like i could see lights from washington you know like i knew you know i kept thinking i was way closer to the trail than i was which was really frustrating you know um but i didn't like there was no like hopelessness i never thought i was going to die or anything like i've been in other near-death situations, you know, where like, you know, I, I was certain I was going to die, you know, I was never, it, people were like, how did you not freak out? Like, why didn't you not get scared? And I was like, well, like, partly because I know panicking makes it harder to think straight and it uses energy that can help your stay alive, you know, like, it, it, uh, um, so, and, and aside from that, like, I was just intently focused on every and, you know, uh, hand and foot movement, you know, like I said, like I was, you know, climbing really sketchy stuff, you know, so I didn't really 
time to be scared, you know? And um, so I was feeling not great, but not like terrified or anything, you know? Um, you said you had another life and death experience or something. What, what's that? Yeah, um, a little like two and a half years ago, I was going for a Darwin Award basically and uh, working under an old van with just a tire changing jack and the jack broke and I was pinned by my skull and chest uh, for it took it took bystanders five tries to get it off of me they kept kind of picking it up a little bit and they'd slip and drop it back on me and I was just you know getting air you know losing air that I couldn't get back and like if, if I'd have done it if I'd been home alone or if they take if they had taken them one more try to pull me out I probably would have died so that, that during that I there was a point where I said I'm gonna f and die you know so I didn't you know there wasn't that same feeling of like helplessness when I was in the woods, you know, like there was always like something else that I could do to try to improve my situation while I was out there, you know, like for the most part until like the third day that I was out there. So. Wow. And then, so you were, you were still headed down kind of downhill this entire time, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. And so then what happened? So day two, um things started to flatten out a little bit more or there was more like flat parts it wasn't just massive you know I don't even know how tall like piles of debris and fallen trees and stuff that I was climbing over it was more rocks and water so I was kind of like crisscrossing across this creek slash this water folly stream that I was on I believe it was Gorton's Creek that I was following um and again, it, but I could still only see so far ahead of me, you know, enough to like plan so I can see around the next corner, you know, and there, the second day there became a couple, like a couple times where I, I just had to kind of just drop down a couple, like 15, 20 foot waterfalls or I just had no other option. And I got like fully submerged in freezing water a couple times. Um, and unfortunately I had some thick wool socks on, you know, my boots weren't great. My boots were, had holes in them at that point, you know. They didn't when I started the hike, but um, yeah, I really think the wool socks were a lifesaver because um, so the second day I got I got wet, you know. Um, and as far as gear, like I wasn't layered very well, you know. I, was, I went out for a day hike, you know. Like I had like a I had a waterproof, fairly warm Carhartt jacket, and I think and a thermal under that. And for pants, I just had like my five eleven paramedic pants, which they wick pretty good, but they're not they're not very wet they're not very warm you know but they they wicked well and dried off pretty quick when i did get wet which was good i think if i had worn jeans as well which i usually do on hikes i probably would have been dead too um or cotton anything you know so second day second day went slow because i kept getting wet and i kept taking like i call them hypothermia breaks like what's for you know every time i'd walk through water or get wet you know like i would stop for a minute and kind of curse or when i did i'd start shivering i would stop and curl up and pull my arms under my sleeves and you know put my hands in my armpits and just try you know make a ball until the shivering was controllable you know and then keep moving you know and tried to keep my core temp up like that and then around shortly after sundown on the second night it started raining a little bit and i started uh getting signs of like second stage hypothermia where i started like kind of seizurey uncontrollably shake you know violently shivering and hallucinating and but i was still present enough to know that i was hallucinating so i i called it a night at that point like i found like a flat part like under a rock out cropping that was kind of dry and it was really kind of tight you know i could barely fit under it so that was a good place to kind of like curl up and retain heat for the night. So I called it a night at that point and, and slept as much as I could. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm like sleeping on rocks, you know, so sleep wasn't great, but um, you know, I, I dried off for the most part, you know, except for my feet and, and stayed out of the rain and got that shivering under control and slept a little bit. And what, then, um, uh, sorry, let me back up. You, okay. you said you were hallucinating a little bit. What were, what were you hallucinating about? What were you seeing? like i was seeing like faces on stumps that was, i saw like some of the little rocks and pebbles around me looked like they had like handmade carvings in them that were like memorials to something like little rocks you know and i knew that that wasn't real you know um i even stuck one in my pocket and looked at it in the morning and there was nothing on it and i like the nature sound started sounding like like to, like beats you know like music you know and um yeah and uh 
I, and I knew that the next phase after that is they just, you know, that's when they just find you dead and naked in the woods because you just your altered status gets even worse and people start thinking they're warm when they're cold and start, you know, and I was like, okay, I'm just calling it a night at this point. So you know, we got under control. Um, I didn't start moving until after sunrise again. So what did you have with you to cover up to keep warm? Nothing. Just my, my jacket. Again, I was just planning on a day hike. I had in my like emergency kit in my car, I had hand warmers, uh, foot warmers, a life straw filter, space blanket, you know, you name it. But I didn't, didn't think to bring any of that on a little day hike, you know, like it's just dumb, you know. Um, so yeah, just, just the clothes that I had on, which wasn't much, but the jacket was good and the wool socks were good for sure. My toes are actually still feel cold. Like I've had to wear double socks this whole time. Like, I don't know if I'm ever going to get full sensation back in my toes. But... Wow. So you were actually just by huddling up able to warm yourself up enough. I mean, enough to stay alive and wow. sane, you know, I think, you know, um, I mean, I'm still here, you know, so <laughs> just, uh, just curl, you just curled up in a ball under a sheltered in a sheltered spot basically, or what? Well, several times, you know, like I said, like I said, whenever I get, my feet wet again and started shivering, you know, like I would just kind of stop where I was and curl up and pull my, pull my arms under my sleeves, you know, and kind of and put my hands on it. Cause I didn't have gloves. So I didn't, you know, um, so my hands were all, my hands were all torn up and really cold. So, you know, I would put them in my armpits, you know, to try and warm them up, you know, and then would do that for like five minutes or so several times throughout that second day. Like pretty much any time I would get wet and start shivering. You know, um, and then at the when it started, the shivering started getting really bad that second night. That's when I curled up and kind of found like kind of a tight spot to curl up in and just sheltered there for the night. Well, how bad? What? Where were your hands cut? How were were they just from getting caught on sticks and stuff? Yeah, like little, little, the little kind of trip wire, thorny brambles, like lots of that. You know, um, just little scrapes. Uh, yeah, I think I might have caught a little spot of poison oak. You know, I don't know. Like there was like a pustule you know like a big thick rash i mean it's all healed up now i couldn't show you but um yeah just a lot of little scrapes and cuts and you know nothing nothing major but yeah it's i'm still growing the skin back on both my hands so and i at some point i tore a hole in the the left back pocket of my pants and um like my whole left butt cheek was just shredded like i pretty much had to grow all the skin back on my butt oh left glute like that that was one of the things that made it really difficult to like move around or get up get up sit up stand up get out of bed get in and out of bed you know so like i said most of the stuff that made it difficult to move when i got out was pretty superficial and is healed up at this point so was that like one big slide that you took with with that no i think i caught it on a little no no because i was like sliding you know it was a bunch you know i I think there's probably one big one but you know there was a lot of like kind of slowly scaling kind of with my back to a wall or sliding down crumbly you know lower grade you know cliffs basically hills and cliffs you know a lot lot of loose rocks and dirt and thorns and you name it pretty much yeah do you know about how far you were off the trail at that point no idea I, i don't know um i knew the trailhead was at the end of this water or, you know, that this water was going to lead to the trailhead at some point. But um, I, I think when I started, I, I was probably maybe three miles, if that. I know when they when they found me on day four, I was less than a mile from the trailhead um, when I got uh, backed out. So. Wow. So what was that first night like? The first night I didn't sleep. I, I, I was just climbing that second night. Um, that's when I... I that started raining and I just kind of hit under a rock for the night. Um, and then the third day, and I kept thinking I was way closer to the trail than I was, you know, I was like, okay, right. It's gotta be right around this corner. And there was a whole, I'll backtrack a little bit to that second day. Like before the first time I like jumped into some water, um, I saw a point where there was just two really steep waterfalls that there was no way that I kind of had to like go back and like kind of gently climb up and around you know, get off the water a little bit or away from the water a little bit to where I couldn't see it anymore and kind of go up and around and gently make my way down to the bottom of the waterfall, you know, climbing the, not fully cliffs, you know, basically cliffs, but the hills around it, you know, the kind of crumbling loose dirt and rocks 
roots and whatnot, you know. Um, and then I spent like maybe at least 30 minutes trying to like kind of maneuver my way around to get to the bottom of these waterfalls without having to jump down the freaking waterfalls. And then I went with it, got within sight of the water again after like probably closer to an hour of that maneuvering and realized I was pretty much in exactly the same spot that I was when I started. Oh. And that was one of the, that was one of the first times I got like really frustrated and just kind of yelled. And that was at that point I was like, okay, I'm just going to have to take my chances with this freaking waterfall and like scale it as best as I can. Like there's a few times, like the news report made it sound like I just fell down a 50 foot cliff and was stuck at the bottom of it for four days. I don't think I ever fell like a whole 50 feet. There was a few like 15 to 20 foot kind of calculated. I can't go any further up. I'm going to have to take my chances with this. I'm going to lose control and just roll with the fall as best as I can. You know, so that's what happened with the, the couple, you know, submersions on that second night or second day and second night. And then the third day I found myself within sight of like, I believe I was within sight of like the Indian point monument thing, you know? So I knew there was trail to the top of me and I knew there was still, you know, I knew there was trail where there was trail above and below me, like relatively close, like probably within a hundred yards above me and less than a mile below me. Um, so of course I tried going down, you know, um, very, very carefully, you know, and again, I'm on like crumbly rocks, you know, I'm like, I've been talking to plants, thanking them, you know, and like didn't realize how much weight I could put on a fern, for example, is one of the things I learned out there, you know, and just, and the, the, the third day is when I got to points where I got to a point where, okay, I, I went down as far as I could, then it was just like a sheer drop of rock, you know, it wasn't anything I could kind of like slide down, you know, there wasn't any solid handholds, you know, like, and that, at that point is the first time I just sat there and kind of screamed for help, you know, and it wasn't that much of a drop. It was probably, you know, 20 feet ish, you know, but it was still like, it was, it was hard. It was solid rock. It wasn't, if it was just dirt or water at the bottom of it, you know, I would have thought about it more, but that's the first time I just sat there kind of screaming for help. Hmm. And there was, no, it, that was pointless. And I knew, you know, I did that for maybe five minutes. I knew that was kind of wasting energy too, because nobody was hearing me, like nobody was out. I think I saw three people all day, you know, before I got lost on that first day. So, you know, normally I normally try to seek out trails that don't have as many people on them, because that's one of the reasons I go hiking is to get away from people. But yeah. <laughs> I've kind of reevaluated my stance on that. <laughs> so, go ahead. So each one of these drop offs that you're coming through, or they're like, a, it's a, a cliff, like a, a waterfall. Um, and then it, it curves around with steep rocky banks, right? So like rocky cliffs on the side, yeah. so it's impossible to get around, right? Pretty much, yeah. Basically yeah. a slot canyon, sort of. At points, for sure, yeah, yeah. It didn't start that way, but it turned into that. And, and it was like, when I knew I was so close to the home stretch, it, it, it was it had turned into that, you know? Um, yeah, on that third day is, is like the, the first time I like sat there screaming for help, you know, like it, it wasn't, and I knew that like things were leveling off at the bottom of that drop, you know, and I knew I was pretty damn sure at that point that, you know, there wasn't going to be any more cliffs, you know, and I could keep following water to, to trail at that point, but I just couldn't, I didn't feel comfortable jumping off that 20 foot drop or trying to climb it. So I tried to climb up, you know, cause like I said, I knew there was trail like a hundred yards above me, you know, or, or ish, you know, so I spent a good, I, I don't even know, an hour or so, you know, and it was just all like, you know, it wasn't, there was only maybe like 20 feet of just vertical, like free climb of crumbling rock. Other than that, you know, like I, I could find like roots, you know, that were stable enough to handhold, you know, and I kind of like made my way halfway up that. Um, and then I lost track of time and it was getting dark again. And there was no way in hell I was going to try to go up any further after dark. Cause it was, you know, I needed to find my handhold. So I found like a a tree, a, a sturdy, small but sturdy tree, kind of growing out the side of the of the cliff, and just decided to kind of huddle up by that until sunrise again. And shortly after dark, and at this point, like um, I'd been drinking river water for a while. I'd ran. I, I came. Fortunately, like I started with like a gallon of water and like a full, like one of these, you know, and a gallon on top of that, and like a thing of coconut water. So that lasted me throughout the first two days 
but towards the end of the second day, I had to start drinking runoff water. And then I'm kind of stuck the, the third night, I'm kind of stuck on the side of this cliff, not even close to the river water. So I started, I started drinking my own urine, which I know I, I've been taught, you know, I know that it makes dehydration worse, but more of my concern at that point was more being able to swallow like the dry, salty trail snacks that I had and keeping my core temperature up. And since then I've, you know, I've read other things that say that you if in an absolute dire emergency, like you can do that for a day or two before it gets to where it's going to destroy your organs and, you know, make things worse. So that whole, that was shortly after sundown on the third night that I had to start drinking pee and, um, Wow. around and then so I, I stayed there by that tree you know until shortly after sun up and then and then I realized that there after after getting a little bit of rest I realized that there was just, there was just no way I could go up any further the way I was trying to go up like it was just too steep it was too crumbly I knew the trail was so close but I just didn't see any safe viable way to do that so I figured I'd try down again and renegotiate or reevaluate um, those cliffs that I wasn't trying to mess with before because I didn't have, I felt like I had no other option. And while I was stuck there, after I realized that, I took another few minutes to just scream for help, you know, like screaming out like my approximate location that I needed search and rescue and still no response. So um, I went down went down and, and, and decided to mess with those, those drop-offs that I figured I shouldn't before. And again, it was kind of a calculated, you know, I'm going to scale this as best as I can, knowing that I'm going to fall and just roll with the fall as best as I can. And, uh, and they were both like kind of those last couple were again, probably 15 to 20 feet each. And the first one, when I did lose control, I smacked my head really hard. Like it, it sounded like a baseball getting hit out of the park. Like as soon as I heard that sound, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm screwed now. Like I, that, that was the first time I like got scared, you know? And I was like, okay, I'm, I, I figured I was just going to pass out and be just fucked part of my language, you know, but um, I somehow shook it off. You know, I didn't even have, you know, I, and when they scanned me at the hospital, there's, I had a bad laceration there, but there was no, no uh, fractured skull or TBI or anything like that. So, so I shook that off and kept going. Wow. And then I had shortly after that, there was like one more drop. And then, and then it looked like it was smooth sailing at that point, you know, and I was like, okay, I'm at the, I was just desperate at that point. You know, I knew nobody was coming to help. And I did that one more time. And that was the one where I broke my wrist. How, and, how far of a and drop was that? Another probably 15 to 20. Um, oh, and I, let me backtrack a little bit. Like I'd say during that fourth day, you know, it was after, after sun up, um, I started getting like uncontrollable explosive diarrhea, like the hole in my pants was way bigger. And I just started like, and it was, that was probably the river water, I'm sure. Um, so that just extra added the dehydration factor and just the literal shittiness of the whole situation, you know, again, pardon my language, but, um, hold on just a sec. So, uh, me so and then after after the fall where i broke my wrist then i feel like actually could you describe so you just kind of let yourself down over the cliff and started to try to climb climb down yeah. and slip basically kind of like gently climb it as best as i could knowing that i wasn't going to be able to like keep quiet make my way down like same with the waterfalls you know i i, I kind of went down as best as i could you know with whatever handholds were available knowing that I was just going to have to drop at some point. And um, that, does that answer your question? Like, yeah. yeah. So I didn't just like jump off of it. You know, I didn't accidentally fall. I knew that I was going to lose control at some point, but that was the only way to get right. back, you know? So then after that last fall is when I think I was starting to get maybe a little delirious at that point. Um, I, I don't remember if I thought I heard voices or if I just started yelling for help again, maybe both. I honestly don't recall. Like I, I'd been drinking pee for like almost 24 hours at this point, you know, like I was completely fully dehydrated, you know, I was, I, was, I, I wouldn't have made it another night had they not found me at that point. So after the wrist break fall, I don't think I even realized I'd broken my wrist at that point. I think I kept trying to go and like, just kind of fell again, not like a 
cliff fall, but just kind of just sat down and was like, okay, I need to breathe and evaluate things. And then I started yelling for help again. And then somebody finally found me. Some, some pretty experienced hikers found me and there wasn't much, I was still on kind of a crumbly slope, kind of like about like that, you know? Um, but a pretty experienced hiker and a really nice couple. I wish I could remember their names. Like he came up and he was pretty good at like ma making solid footholds and helping me get down to flat ground where um, the responders, you know, uh, I believe the local sheriffs and fire department and I think AMR found me, but I was like, and I was like about a mile off the trail. And I think they figured that I was too, it was too risky to move me after, you know, knowing that I had hit my head and that, uh, you know, how long I'd been out there. And I, I was probably, I think I was with it enough to tell them my, you know, my name and location and your standard orientation, you know, like uh, mental status evaluation stuff, but I was still kind of, kind of losing it. So at that point they, they called the Coast Guard and they helicoptered me out of there. What was that couple doing in that area? Uh, they're probably going for a hike too, I'm sure. Like I said, I was less than a mile from the trailhead. When so they you found think they just, they were on the other trail then, or on the trail when they yeah, heard you? Like the, the, the first part, you know, the beginning of the trail, they're probably heading back, you know, cause it was almost dark at that point. Like they were probably like on their way back down to their car, I'm sure, you know, um, when they heard me, so. Wow. Yeah. Cause it, cause it, 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 the trail I was on the Gordon Creek one, like it intersected with other ones that were like less sketchy, but I want to take the steeper one. I want you know, one of the reasons I go hiking is because I want that workout, you know, um, I had no idea. And again, again, I, I really feel it should have been, should have been closed. It probably is again now, but you know, just, yeah. How were you feeling when they, when they found you? It's really good. Yeah. Um, thankful. Uh, because they, uh, you know, I mean, they brought me water. It was more river water, but still, like, you know, again, I've been drinking pee for a day at that point, you know, um, and I, I, but it felt pretty amazing, you know, yeah. Why did you continue to drink pee when, when you were near the river water, back down by the river water? I wasn't. Okay, you'd stopped. I, I, like, they, like, I was still kind of, like, on a, on a cliffside like that when they found me, you know, and, like, he was kind of gently making his way up to me, he was more experienced than I was. He was like, I'm gonna come up and, and check you out. And, 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 you know, I don't remember, I don't remember exactly how that went down, but his wife or his girl, his partner was, you know, stayed at the bottom of the little slope that I wanted. It wasn't, you know, I wasn't that high up, you know, but it was still kind of sketchy to get any further down in my condition. Um, and so I think, you know, she was able, you know, he was able to hand her my water bottle and she went and filled it up for me and brought it back, you know, so I hadn't, you know, had I, I still wasn't close enough to the water to drink it, you know? Um, yeah, I see. What was that like when they actually found you and lifted you out with the helicopter? Kind of surreal. Um, like people asked me if I got dizzy. I don't know if you saw the video of it, but I was spinning around quite a bit. Like, um, it, I mean, I was glad to be out, but I mean, they couldn't give me anything for pain. Like I started feeling the, fra I don't know, I fractured two vertebrae. Like I started feeling I have like back issues anyway. And like when I, they had me kind of, strapped in and cease find, you know, like that my back started getting like agonizingly bad, you know. Um, I, I was really, really thirsty, you know, um, but you know, protocol is don't let anybody eat or drink anything until a doctor clears it, you know, so um, I was glad to be getting out, but, and then they had to reposition, like they picked me up like halfway and then they had to put the basket back down and like reposition the helicopter or something because of some trees. So that was kind of weird. I didn't really, notice the spinning that much you know like I they had a big thick face shield that I could barely see out of you know and I was packaged so tight you know like I could feel it but I didn't get like dizzy or nauseous or anything you know um where did they set you down at finally Emmanuel so they flew you right to the hospital yeah yeah I was uh first they, they were taking me that way just you and then I got re-diverted to Emmanuel for some reason and I was in the trauma unit for three days even though my physical traumas weren't that bad like they had to treat um the dehydration the hypothermia like they couldn't even get an oral temp when i first came in and when they could get a rectal temp it was 33 celsius and normal temp i think is 37.5 if i'm not you know so was, and rhabdomyolysis was the other main thing so um I, which is i don't know if you know what that is no it, when like people that go really hard with like CrossFit and like high intensity workouts when they go too hard, like your muscle cells basically kind of explode and deteriorate. 
and you know the contents of your muscle cells get into your interstitial fluid. So my electrolyte levels were really, and it can really be, it can destroy your kidneys and liver. Um, so that was the main reason I was in the hospital for three days because they had them getting me rehydrated, which was diluting, you know, my electrolyte levels. So I, you know, I had, I had IVs of fluids with extra electrolytes and stuff. So it took them three days to like kind of get my, get my levels right, you know, before I could go. So, so what were the extent of your injuries? Um, a lot of scrapes and bruises. Um, my left radius is broken, uh, like at the head of it, but they said that the way it hit require surgery, you know, like it was kind of like a straight impact. So it didn't like splay out. So it's able to kind of heal in place with the brace. Uh, my T10 and T11 vertebrae are fractured. Um, but they said, as long as I'm mindful of, you know, my posture and alignment and stuff that that should heal on its own without any invasive stuff. And, um, I think that's it. Just, just, just really banged up, you know, um, and I feel like I might have some cracked ribs on the right side too, because it just, it feels the same as when I had that, that van incident, you know, I broke ribs on both sides and it feels this kind of the same as that. Um, but other than that, like I'm, I'm, I'm doing all right. Wow. What? And, and the, the sustained like kind of frostbite in my toes, like I said, like one of my toenails, I just pulled off completely the other day and it's growing back and yeah. So my tips of my toes still feel cold, but other than that, I'm doing all right. What was the uh, temperature most of the time? Out there? Yeah, could you, you did you have a thermometer with you or could you no. tell? Was I have no idea. Freezing? That rain on the second night ever turned to snow. Like, I think it definitely got below freezing, but probably not by much. Like, if if I had waited another week or two, I'd probably be dead. You know, if it was this time, you know, I would my outcome probably would have been much worse. Like, the water was definitely freezing temperature, you know, because it was snow melt off. You know, it was running was the only reason it wasn't frozen, you know, so, um, yeah. When did you run out of food? I never did. Um, I had like a big bag of jerky because like I, I drive, I do Uber and Lyft for a living. So I usually have like a big bag of snacks, you know, on my passenger side, you know, so, and I brought, you know, like a bag of jerky and more, more food than I needed for a day hike. So I had uh, some mixed nuts and some jerky and like some like probiotic granola stuff, you know, I actually had some like wasabi peas that I never even opened, you know, cause I figured that would just make me thirstier, you know, but I, I had ample food for sure. Yeah. So fortunately, yeah. Wow. That's probably one of the things that saved you actually. For sure. Yeah. Oh, and I had, uh, I had some um, like the kind of brand, like dark chocolate almond bark stuff mm. for like the first that's that I ran out of, it was just a little bag of it, but I think that really helped. I ran out of that like, late the first night or the the second day i think that really helped keep the glucose up you know and keep my energy up and keep me awake you know what did you have in your pack uh a zippo that didn't work um <laughs> my snacks and water um and that was about it yeah like do you know why your zippo didn't work uh i think it needed fluid which i had in my car as well you know like it was just happened to be in my bag you know <laughs> like i didn't uh didn't think i was gonna need it you know so what would you do differently um definitely portable camp phone charger i think would have saved the whole situation that could have kept me on trail the whole time had my phone not died uh more layers for sure um, and just like a few of those little things that I didn't think that I would need that I had that could easily fit in my pack without adding much more weight, you know, like a freaking space blanket and some foot warmers, you know, um, a headlamp would be good. I didn't even, like I said, I had my little pocket flashlight in my mouth, you know, while I was like trying to climb shit and, um, trying to think, oh, definitely let people know where I was even through like Facebook or whatever, like I'm single and I'm a family or anything, but I'm online a lot. And ironically, my last Facebook post was just found out the hard way that Indian or Eagle Creek is closed at like 9.15 that morning. And then I was radio silent for uh, a week because I lost my phone. Like I didn't have a phone in the hospital, so I couldn't, I couldn't, I didn't have any of my contacts to let anybody know what happened or where I was. So 
um, yeah. Wow. Phone charger, more layers, and just you know a few more light things like 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 headlamp and uh, yeah, and letting people know where I was. Yeah. Did anybody notice that you were were missing at any point? I don't think so. No, my roommate was starting to wonder, you know, but you know we don't know each other. So I just moved in here a couple months ago, you know. So um, yeah, I don't think anybody really really knew. Yeah. What was the extent of your medical expenses you have a gun go fund me page going i do and thank god some like my uh I, oregon health plan automatically renewed itself over the fall and i had no idea so it looks like i'm covered and and, and you know it was a, it was a coast guard helicopter not a life flight so i don't think we would anybody would get a bill for that you know um thank god because life flight you know i mean that's i think 10 grand just to start those helicopters, you know? <laughs> um, and so right now, like the GoFundMe is helping, like it's covering my bills and lost work. You know, I, again, I'm not, I was able to drive a little bit just down to the store yesterday, but I don't feel comfortable like going back to work quite yet until I get my arm reevaluated in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. So, so I don't know, you know, but thank God this apparently the in the hospital let me know that like I was freaking out about the expenses, but they said we just sent a bill of the state looks like you're covered. And I'm not going to question it right now, you know, like, because I, um, I don't make a lot of money and I don't have any savings, you know, so the GoFundMe and the meal train are helping me to stay afloat and cover lost lost wages until I can get back to work. And I have to move soon too. So it's going to help with that. So. Wow. All right, well, I'll put up links to that in the description below this video. I appreciate it. So did you discover a good canyon for slot canyoning? <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what that means. <laughs> oh, well, you know, slot canyon are those canyons that you can't get out of. Yeah. Uh, and you can take a rope down and go explore. And there are a few hidden slot canyons in the Columbia Gorge. And, you know, there's a lot oh. down by Zion. And, and oh, yeah. I think, I, think, I think like most of that second day where it kind of flattened out a bit. Like I saw some cool rocks for sure. And I, th I felt like I might've been in places where humans had never been or hadn't been in quite some time, you know? Um, yeah, I've, I've, I, I definitely had the feeling like that second day that I might've been in like a cool, like kind of hidden spot that people couldn't normally get to. But what type of work is it that you said you did again? I just drive right now, uh, just Uber and Lyft. Um, I'm two tests away from my paramedic certification. Uh, I did, I completed the 2019 OHSU paramedic program. I just got to, I, I finished it and got my associates. I just got to do the, uh, the two tests. I, the first of the two tests I have to take, I have to go to California for, and they haven't, I just, every time I'm close to booking that trip, some random 2020 crap would happen and kind of set me back. You know, I'd miss a week of work and, you know, then this happens and, you know, but uh, hopefully I'll be all sorted up by the end of the year. I have, I just renewed my EMT basic, but sadly I make better money driving, you know, but don't even get me started on that soapbox. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so I'm just waiting until I have that higher pay grade assert, and then I'm, I'd like to look into some kind of like a community medic kind of stuff. Like I said, I used to be homeless, so I'd like to, there's starting to be programs for that under the fire department, like street response outreach stuff. I'd like to get into that. So, but right now I'm just driving, so not working at the moment until my arm's healed. Uh, what do you think, uh, do you think that any of your training as a paramedic helps you at all? For sure. Yeah, especially knowing like, you know, the, the, um, the importance of keeping core temperature up and being able to spot those signs of the hypothermia advancing, you know, and knowing when I needed to just stop and find a place, the tight space to huddle up in. Um, and I mean, actually, you know, my training would have said not to drink pee, like I said, because I know it makes hypothermia worse. But at the same time, I was just trying to eat and stay warm, you know, so um but yeah i i i think so for sure as far and 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 the staying calm is especially you know like you know i've learned a lot about you know how being in a panicked sustained fear elevated fear state is just bad for you all around you know i learned that in school for sure you know so yeah i would say most definitely yeah do you i don't know if you want to go into this but do you mind me asking how did you become homeless and how did you become unhomeless? It was a long time ago. I mean, I was just a bad kid. I got like 24 hours to get out of the house when I was, I think, barely 16. Um, 
and I was like that for you know there was some like couch surfing with friends there was a lot of just sleeping in dumpsters and under bushes and stuff um just luck and good friends and family I guess is how I got out of it you know because it's really hard to get out of and this is like late 90s you know before everybody had cell phones you know so it made it extra difficult to you know comes up frequently with passengers you know because Portland's having a crazy houseless epidemic right now you know so it's a very common conversation topic and it's funny hearing how the tone changes when I mentioned that I used to be homeless and how hard it is to get out of that you know once you once you're in it it's really easy to be complacent and just be like this is how my life is now you you know you just kind of adapt and get used to it and uh lose hope um and uh but but as far as like survival goes you know and just learning to get by on hardly anything and you know I'm no stranger to sleeping outside in wet condition wet cold conditions with nothing but my jacket and backpack you know what I mean so I think that might have helped me stay calm and get through the wilderness adventure there so yeah is there anything else you'd like to say respect nature you know let people know where you're gonna go um don't overpack but bring more than you think you might need for even just a light day hike you know um hiking buddies are probably a good idea too but other than that you know um be more prepared than you think you might need to be great thank you for your time i really appreciate it during bailey's hike and in this interview bailey thought he was close to indian point and that there were two trails above him on either side of the canyon. These observations were inaccurate. It wasn't until after he previewed this documentary and the animated maps that he saw his location relative to the actual features that he realized how far off he really was. You see, Bailey mistook a closer rock outcropping for Indian Point, and the trail he thought was above him to the east was actually on the opposite side of the next valley over and the trail to the west that he thought was on the ridge above him had actually already turned away from the ridge and was headed in the opposite direction. Also, even though he was trapped in the Box Canyon, he was quite close to the trail that led to the two waterfalls below him. And there was an unofficial trail that actually led to the area Bailey was rescued from on the final day. However, unaware of the trail and in his altered state of mind, Bailey was unable to locate the route down from the canyon. It's easy to judge people in these situations and think we wouldn't make similar miscalculations. However, experienced search and rescue crew members have made similar mistakes during training exercises and in real life situations. It's one of the reasons search and rescue teams usually stick in groups of three or four, with one of them focusing solely on navigation. And it's one more reason for each of us to at least take a map of the area we are hiking in and a compass it's also another reason not to hike alone. One other point worth noting, Bailey said that he felt like he needed to drink his own urine because the water was inaccessible and he felt like the creek water was giving him diarrhea. Some people say it's okay to drink your own urine in a survival situation. However, the US Army Field Guide says not to because it contains harmful body waste and it's about 2% salt. Basically, it's close to drinking seawater, but with extra toxins. Apparently, there is a health craze where people drink their own urine, which most medical professionals do not recommend, but even urine therapy advocates warn the dangers of excessive urine consumption. During a worldwide conference of urine therapy practitioners, the Chinese Association of Urine Therapy warned that drinking urine has negative side effects, including diarrhea, fatigue, fever, and muscle soreness. These symptoms increase with the amount of urine ingested. And here's another intriguing detail that developed after this interview. Recently, Bailey returned to the trail, and that same day, some hikers discovered Bailey's keys that were lost months ago. They returned to the parking lot, used the remote on the key to access his car, managed to find Bailey's phone number in his car, and then called Bailey to return his keys to him. Also, I recently spoke with Bailey again about the GoFundMe campaign, and he's still recovering financially from the incident. I'll put a link to his GoFundMe page in the description below if you would like to help out. There are many other lessons Bailey learned from his experience. What did you learn? I look forward to reading your stories in the comments below. 
Until next time, I'm Nakia, and this is Rat and Cat Search and Survival. Get out there, be safe, and enjoy the wild. Thank you.